show of hands before we get started. Um, who has visited us in Brenham before? Okay, fantastic. So I'm not talking to strangers here, so y'all will know if I say something wrong, so just call me out. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, before we get started, uh, we'd like to make just a couple of introductions, tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, can y'all hear in the back? Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. Um, well, my name is Lauren Lewis. I'm the Public Relations Manager at Bluebell. Uh, I am a Brenham uh, native, born and raised there, so I've been there my whole life, just right down the road. Uh, for school, I didn't go too far. I'm a graduate of A&M. Uh, yep, thank you. I love it. Uh, I graduated from A&M in 2020 with my bachelor's in marketing. And then I got my master's degree in marketing as well from Mays. So uh, as soon as I graduated, I moved right back to Brenham, back home, and I started working for Bluebell. So I've been there for a little over two years now. So I'm still pretty young in the game compared to the people at Bluebell who've been there for, you know, 30, 40 years. So uh, compared to them, I'm still a baby, but, you know, we're having fun. Um, yeah, a little bit about me, and then I'll let Noah introduce himself. Absolutely. So my name is Noah Ragonis. I also work in public relations with Lauren. Um, I was not born in Brenham, but I lived there basically since I was five years old. We moved up there from Houston. Um, I graduated from Baylor, actually, not an Aggie, so if there's any bears in the house, you know. <laughs> hey, there's one. Um, yeah, no, I actually started working at Bluebell scooping ice cream in the parlor the summer before I graduated. Um, so. Went there the summer before, <laughs> scooped for the summer, went back to school for my senior year, graduated in May, and then came back here to work, and I've been working at Bluebell for a little over a year now, so, yeah, and we're happy to be here with y'all, and happy to present to y'all today, so, yeah. hope y'all enjoy. Awesome, so, uh, we'll get started, Noah totally, totally skipped a part of my history at Bluebell, oh. it started working there when I was 16 years old, that was my very first job as a tour guide, back in 2014, and then went off to college and came back. I totally forgot about that part of my history. Um, that might be an important one. Um, so now we're just professional tour guides, more or less. So it's a ton of fun. We tell people when they ask what we do for a living, we throw ice cream parties for a living. <laughs> so it's really the best job in the entire world. So today we'll talk to you a little bit about Bluebell, talk to you about our history, a little bit about how we make our ice cream um, and how we kind of have progressed over the years. And then at the end, if you have any questions, which hopefully y'all will, please fire away, uh, we'd be happy to answer them. So we have been making ice cream uh, for over 100 years. We actually celebrated 116 years uh, this month. Uh, we were founded in 1907 in Brenham, Texas. We actually originally made butter instead of ice cream. So we would take local dairy uh, from the farmers in the area and we would turn that into butter. Um, it wasn't until four years later that we actually started making ice cream. Um, so since then we have made quite a few flavors and we have uh, produced a lot since then but back in 1911 we could actually only make two gallons a day so yeah imagine that we could only produce two gallons a day that's like enough for like maybe a quart like a tenth of us in here it's enough for me. Um, yeah not not anymore um, after that, you know, we started progressing. People started picking up on the name. So uh, in 1930, we changed the name to Bluebell. Uh, so from the Brenham Creamery Company, we changed it to Bluebell Creameries after the Bluebell flower. So a lot of people might get it confused between a Bluebell and a Blue Bonnet. So Blue Bonnets are in the spring, they're blue. And then bluebells grow in the Texas summer months, great for ice cream eating weather. So those are some uh, bluebell flowers right there. Just six years later, we bought our first refrigerated truck. So originally we were delivering ice cream by horse and buggy. Um, so imagine back in the day. And then in the 30s, we finally bought our refrigerated truck and it's actually sitting in the courtyard in Brenham. So if you come visit us at the creamery, and you see that truck out front, that is actually our original number one truck. Um, it still runs, it still works. Um, we drive it every now and then. Um, so that is the original truck. And something great um, about this is that now we have our entire fleet. So it's what we call direct store distribution, which Noah will touch on later. Um, it's a very unique aspect of Bluebell in the fact that we uh, handle the product from the very beginning to the very end. Um, something very, very unique. 
1977, so this is what we originally, so we went from the Burnham Creamery Company to Bluebell Creameries. And then in 1977, we were called Bluebell, but our logo was a Bluebell flower. And in 77 is whenever we changed over to the Cow and Girl logo. So what we all know today is the iconic Cow and Girl logo, which is on every piece of branding, every piece of marketing, our name tags here, you'll see it everywhere. Um, one thing that we love talking to people about is this branding aspect. It's so important, known as a Texas brand, um, as the little creamery in Brenham. Uh, we'll hear parent stories of their young kids who can't even talk yet, but they'll point at the Bluebell truck going down the road because they know that's ice cream. <laughs> they know there's something good in there. Or they're walking down the grocery store aisle and they'll point out Bluebell. They'll know that's ice cream. That's the good stuff right there. Um, so this Cow and Girl logo, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere anytime soon. So a lot happened over the next few years. We started growing and growing more. So we started selling in Louisiana. We started building in Oklahoma. In 2007, we celebrated our 100 year anniversary. It was a huge deal, a huge celebration. Uh, we had a couple things go on. So we came out with our iconic uh, 100 year anniversary book. You can still get those today. There's some great stories in there. We came out with a couple flavors, anniversary cake, and Century Sunday. Those were some iconic flavors as well. And then that truck that went by, we drove that around the United States and had a really big ice cream party. <laughs> so now looking at kind of where we are today. So there's a couple things I'd like to point out. This is our territory map. Um, this is all the places that we service. So anything that's colored on this map, it's parts of 23 states. So we've been making ice cream for over 100 years, but we've actually only made it to parts of 23 states. And yes, that includes that one county in Wyoming up there. We do count that. We do count that one. So you'll see right here in Brenham, uh, that is where we are located. That is headquarters. That is where we are. We have another production facility right here in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. That one was built in 1992. And then we've got another production facility right there in Sylacauga, Alabama. Uh, that one was built in 1996. So in Brenham, we have around 850 to 900 employees. That includes um, all of the corporate sales, marketing department, HR, accounting, as well as production and our drivers in Brenham. And then total overall, it's about 3,100 employees across the board. So uh, each one of these cities down here indicates what we call a distribution center. <coughs> Basically from our production facilities, the ice cream is then distributed to those facilities and they're the ones that take it to the grocery stores or the retailers. So we have about 66 of those, which encompasses the 3,100 employees. So you can see, very slow growing, um, but it's because we want that personal level of service and quality and care to all of our products, no matter where we go. So this is our burn facility. You guys already know what it looks like because you've already been there. Um, but this right here, just to kind of tell you if you haven't been there, this right here, this is where Noah and I work in this front building. And then the rest of that is all production. That's the cool part. That's where we actually make the ice cream. Uh, if you come and visit us, you'll see we've got a parlor. It kind of used to be a little bit different. Uh, the parlor and where the visitor center is, I guess, um, has kind of changed over the years. And maybe some of y'all have visited in different parts of the plant. Um, it used to be over here, and then it was over there, and now it's over there, and who knows where it's gonna go next. Um, but this is our Brenham facility. We also have a parlor in our Sylacauga, Alabama plant. So if you're ever in Alabama or you're going to Birmingham and you want to take a 40 minute drive down to Sylacauga, um, you can go see an observation deck there as well. Go to our parlor, talk, talk to some folks there as well. So we have that available as well. So a few parts of the business, um, because a lot of people think it's just making ice cream. How hard could it really be? Um, it's actually a science to it, and there's a lot of key components to it. This is just kind of a breakdown, um, and more often, because Noah and I do these presentations um, or variations of this to all different age groups. Um, last month, we were here in this library uh, presenting to four-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds. So we'll talk to little elementary school kids. We'll go to high schools and do those presentations, we'll do colleges and even corporate presentations. So, um, but everyone finds it super interesting that it's not just ice cream. There's a lot of people and a lot of thought that goes involved um, 
one thing we say is either you work at Bluebell, your family works at Bluebell, or you know someone that works at Bluebell. Uh, if you live in Brenham or if you're from there. Um, and what we like to say is there's a lot of skin in the game because we receive all the ingredients ourselves, we make it ourselves, we market it ourselves, so all the social media, the websites, everything you see online, we do all that in-house. Um, and then all the distribution side, the selling aspect of it, the driving of it, we do all that ourselves as well. And that's something that we really take a lot of pride in and something that, you know, we hold close, uh, close to the business. So that's just a little bit uh, about that. Awesome. Um, so that was like super brief, uh, recapped a hundred years worth of history. Um, but if you have questions about it later, uh, please feel free to ask, but I'm going to pass this over to Noah and he'll tell you a little bit about how we actually make ice cream. Absolutely. Okay. So how are we doing? All right. So yeah, uh, typically the life cycle of a flavor, um, let's just get the next slide, uh, starts in research and development. So we usually typically make about three to five new flavors every year. So and then that whole process begins in research and development. Uh, we get hundreds of ideas, mostly from consumers, but also from employee family recipes and just other random emails that we get to consumer relations. And research and development sifts through all those and decides which flavors are feasible. We go through taste panels, which I'm not fortunate enough to be a part of, <laughs> but we do have a lot of taste panels that are very well trained to look at not just the taste, but also the consistency, the temperature, how it melts. There's a whole lot of science behind it. So yeah, a lot goes into making those flavors. It takes about two years for a new flavor from idea conception to the time it's on store shelves. So yeah, lots of food science in that as well. And throughout our company's history, we have made over 300 flavors. So and typically we'll make about 30 to 40 in a given year. So that includes standard flavors, but also rotational flavors and seasonal flavors and on top of the three to five new flavors every year. So we make a whole lot of ice cream. It's <laughs> basically what I'm saying. <laughs> so the whole process starts uh, in the milk bay. So our number one ingredient, of course, in ice cream is milk. Um, we receive milk 24 seven. It's our only 24 seven operation. Um, we get milk from about within a 200 mile radius of the plant um, and typically for about one day's worth of production in Brenham it takes about 50,000 cows worth of milk so <laughs> yeah so yeah and then you factor in of course silicaga and broken arrow and then you're sitting at about 80 to 90,000 cows worth of milk for one day so yeah something to chew on <laughs> So yeah, once we receive the milk, uh, we start our mixed processing process, uh, which basically mixes the milk, cream, and sugar uh, to make our base ice cream. We, make, we also add cocoa powder at this point so that it can be the same consistency as our other base uh, flavors. So it starts in the blend tank, of course, where we blend those ingredients. And then it goes through a proce two processes, which we call homogenization and pasteurization. Homogenization is basically um, pushing the mix through a piston, through pistons, through tiny pinholes, breaking up any butterfat particles and things like that to make the mix very smooth and creamy. Uh, and then of course we have pasteurization, which heat treats the mix. They'll warm it up to about 180 degrees for about 25 seconds and then cool it back down to 40 degrees. So this is all made a day in advance for the next day where we actually, you know, make our flavors and fill them into the cartons. So whenever they finish making the base for the day, they put them in our holding tanks. Each tank holds about 3,000 gallons of mix, which is about the equivalent to two African elephants in weight. And we have <laughs> about six of those <laughs> per room, so, and there's about four rooms, so a whole lot of ice cream being made. So from there, once we've, the mix is sat in the holding tank, it goes through first our flavoring tanks, and this is where a flavor kind of gets its own profile. You add mint extract, even vanilla extract, chocolate syrup, anything like that to make the base ice cream for that day. Uh, and then from there, uh, it goes through our freezer tanks, which whips and chills that mix to about 22 degrees, so it's kind of like a milkshake consistency. 
And then of course, after that's been done, they add any inclusions is what we call them, any you know, marshmallows, cake pieces, fruits, nuts, anything like that gets added right before it gets filled into the carton. Um, of course, once it's filled into the carton, right before the mix actually hits the carton, there's an inline metal detector as well. That'll detect any trace amounts of metal. And if there is any, it'll divert it into buckets below to be sifted through for quality control. Um, but yeah, from there, uh, the ice cream gets put into the carton. Uh, it gets spun as it's filled. And that's the reason they spin it is to prevent air pockets and also to evenly distribute any inclusions that are in the mix as well. Uh, and then from there, they pack it uh, forward to a sleeve, they flip it upside down, and they send it down to our blast freezer. Um, so the reason they flip it upside down is when it freezes, the mix is kind of like that milkshake consistency like I mentioned earlier. So it freezes and expands and sticks to the lid of the container, which is why it's such a struggle whenever you buy it at the store to yank that thing off. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it'll be sitting there for about five to nine hours until its uh, core temperatures reach zero. Um, and then from there, it sits in cold storage typically for about two weeks where we can test it and hold it, make sure it's safe for consumption before we send it out to our grocers. So, yeah. And then from there, <laughs> I wish it were mine. <laughs> no, yeah. Uh, but then from there, yeah, we like Lauren said, we do our own distribution. So we send out our, well, whatever we make in the Brenham plant or Silicaga or Broken Arrow, we send out in the 18 wheelers that you see up there. Those go straight to our branches. And then from there, our branches will deliver it to their local grocers in our bobtail trucks, which are down here in the bottom right. So, yeah, we like to say that, you know, um, our employees uh, handle our product from the time it's, you know, we receive the milk to the time it's flipped up upright again when they put it on the store shelf. So, yeah, it's a very special process. And, yeah, our driver salesmen always make sure to, um, merchandise it correctly you know we we have a little display of cartons actually in our office and a lot of times when we have branches come and take a little tour just as a refresher they'll mess with our carton wall and merchandise it and make it look like this right here <laughs> so that's always fun to see um, and then yeah that's about all we have for y'all so if y'all have any questions please yeah let us know and Laura and I will do our best to answer Uh, that's a great question. So, Would you does, like to? does that mic work? Hello, hello. No. Okay, okay, no. So, the question was how do we decide where our distribution centers go? So, a uh, great aspect as we grow, we have to decide. So, the markets that we're in now, we're entering brand new markets that we've never been in before. Um, so, we have to look at population size, we have to look at you know, where consumers are asking for. So if we're, say, we're in Las Vegas right now, um, that's about as far as west as we go, we have people in Utah that are just begging. They're like, where can I get Bluebell? Like, come here. And so we're thinking logistically, okay, how can we get a route or a truck up to Utah? Do we have to build a branch there? We have to think about employing it. Um, we use what we call the ripple effect. So if you're here and you have Bluebell, the people outside of that area start hearing about it, then they want it and then we'll naturally go there just because of the way we deliver the ice cream. We don't have warehouses where we store it and then they just ship it all over the place. So we have to think about staffing it ourselves. Um, it's a big deal. And another really weird component of it too, um, when looking at also production facilities is where there are uh, large amounts of dairy farms because we source everything locally. So like Noah said, uh, we source the milk within a 200 mile radius of Brenham. So a lot of it comes from the Stephenville area. So specifically for Brenham. So we have to think about, you know, where is there a surplus of dairy farms that we could source from to get the freshest ingredients possible. So a lot of different aspects to it. And obviously like um, our map, mm -hmm. see if I can go back to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brief pause. <laughs> Yeah, so you'll see, so Colorado is a very weird instance of not growing with a ripple effect. A lot of that is because there's mountains and we can't drive over mountains. 
we'll get you your ice cream any way possible, but we might not drive over a mountain for you. Um, so that's a very rare instance of our branches in Denver. And then we have two what we call transfer stations, basically mini branches that run remote routes. So we have one in Colorado Springs and one in, is there a love field or? Love yeah, I think maybe there. Mm -hmm. So we've got two transfer stations. Yeah. So that's kind of like the odd, oddball out. Also finding accounts and retailers that'll carry us. Uh, Cause at the end of the day, we have to have a place to put our ice cream. You can't just hand it out. You know, we do sometimes, um, mm -hmm. but to make money, we have to have retailers uh, and accounts. So uh, great question. Yeah. Ooh, great question. Yep. So the, the question was, what are our top, I'll tell you the top five best-selling flavors. Homemade vanilla through and through is number one best-selling flavor. Uh, it was invented in 1969. It took us two years to create that flavor. Howard Cruzy uh, specifically made sure to perfect that recipe, making sure it was different than any other vanilla on the market. Um, so that was in 1969. Cookies and cream uh, is number two. That one, great story. It was invented in the 80s. Well, technically, it was on stores in 78. 1978 is when it was first available. Uh, we were actually the first to mass produce cookies and cream ice cream. So because we were still a relatively small company at the time, we couldn't secure any kind of cookie partnership or a cookie supplier. So we would send our employees to the store. They would clear, no, this is true story, y'all, true story, y'all. I'm being serious. I wouldn't lie to y'all. Uh, our employees would actually go to the stores, clear off the shelves, open the packages, and crush them by hand and put it in the ice cream. And that's how we were doing it in 1978. <laughs> it's a true story, I promise. Because it grew in popularity by so much, it was a standard flavor, one of our best-selling flavors, two years later, and we built our own bakery for it. So after that, we made our own bakery, and I'll tell you what, as an elementary school kid, because there's an elementary school right down the road from Brenham, just a few hundred yards, whenever there was a north wind and you were on the playground, you could smell the cookies being baked. And I'll tell you, it's something I'll never forget being a kid out there. So cookies and cream. And then I would have to say Dutch chocolate is number three. Great divide, which is crazy because it's homemade in Dutch, which are already on the list. Uh, but great divide is number four and then butter pecan is five. So that's pretty much every region um, out there. Those are pretty much your top five. And then of course we have market specific flavors. We have certain taste profiles that sell better in certain markets. If you're looking at the uh, Florida region, fruit flavors sell fantastic there. So we have certain flavors that we'll never see here in Texas, which is so unfortunate. But years ago, they used to have a mango key lime tart. Wow. Yeah, I know, it sounds fantastic, right? Yeah, I'd love for it to be here. Um, but that was a market specific because they like those kinds of fla uh, flavor profiles. Um, up in the Virginias, banana pudding sells like no joke. Um, in Las Vegas, pistachio almond uh, is a great selling flavor. So some areas do better than others, but for the most part, those are, those are top five. Yeah. How do you decide what kind of run you're going to have? You know, here's Mm -hmm. vanilla, Absolutely. here's some other flavor. How do you let the production plant know mm -hmm. how many half gallons to mm -hmm. run and how does that process yeah. work? That's a great question. You yeah. that one? Absolutely. Yeah, so the question was how do we decide which flavor to run for the day um, on each line? So typically, um, I will say homemade vanilla is pretty much always run in some form or fashion. Every single day. Every single day, whether it's in a three ounce cup, half gallon pint, anything. All of our, they, it comes in all of our sizes. Um, but it's typically mostly just what is high in demand or what inventory is low, anything like that. So it can change, you know, a line can run six different flavors in six different days. We usually run one flavor per line per day. So you know, typically, um, just so we don't cross contaminate or anything like that, it just stays central to that area. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, that's basically. Yeah, I'll take you back on that. Absolutely, yeah. Um, 
So one thing that Noah kind of touched on was the fact that we only run one flavor per line per day. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really talk about our production hours. Right. So we'll make ice cream Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. till 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we don't make ice cream for that long. Um, after that, we go through a nine hour cleaning process. So we take apart every pipe, every machine, everything that was used, clean it thoroughly. That way the next day we can make another flavor. Uh, because say you have a gluten, allergy. So say we were making cookies and cream and then the next day we were going to make homemade vanilla on that same line. That way if you do have an allergen, you're 100% sure that there's not that allergen in it. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually clean a lot longer than we actually make ice cream yeah. every day, which is why we don't do tours or anything like that on the weekends. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so the founder of the Creamery, so back in 1907, it was a group of local businessmen that got together to form the Vernon Creamery Company. It was E.F. Cruzy um, that kind of took over in 1930, 1920s, 1930s. Uh, E.F. Cruzy was the one that kind of founded um, the Bluebell that we know today. And then from then, it was the Cruzy family. Uh, both E.F. Cruzy, Howard, and Ed Cruzy, mm -hmm. um, his sons that took over and were working in the plant, um, Paul Cruzy, and so all of them uh, throughout. So uh, local businessmen in Brenham, but then the Cruzy family from there. Yeah. Do you still provide any other products at all? Like you did that really good with the butter. And do you provide products to anybody else to use another so the so great question. So we actually discontinued making butter in 1958. So in 1958 we stopped making butter solely focused on ice cream. In my opinion, I think it's a great decision. Um, but as far as using our ice cream for like other brands or other products, do people put their ice cream in like uh, uh, ice cream sandwiches or something? So we don't. So in that sense, no. Um, but we do have what we call food ser food service accounts. So. Um, in town, oh gosh, I forget what it's called. Um, but if there's like a milkshake place or a place that serves, you know, ice cream sandwiches that they might make themselves, um, that is what we'd say a food service account. So there's one in Nashville specifically. Mm -hmm. It's called Legendary Milkshake, and they go through over a hundred of our big three gallons a week. Um, and it's our best, I mean, it's the one that goes for the most ice cream in the region. Mm -hmm. um, and they will take our ice cream and make milkshakes out of them. So in that sense, yes, we do service food service accounts and restaurants and parlors that can take our ice cream and create their own desserts from it. But as far as um, like on the manufacturing side, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no cheap knockoffs that I can buy somewhere else. No, <laughs> unfortunately, no. There's one blue bell and then that's... That's what you get. I mean, you can also make homemade ice cream. That's pretty good too, but no. Yeah, just one blue bell. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why did y'all quit making the Italian cream cake? Oh, man, that was the best. So, a lot of our consumer questions are in regards to where did my favorite flavor go? What happened to it? And is it ever going to come back? So, I will say, never count it out because there are flavors that continue to come back out. Tin Roof, for example, was one that wasn't out for a long time, but then we came back out with it this year um, because our peanut supplier actually wasn't making peanuts anymore and we couldn't find an adequate replacement. One thing that we have found is that people are extremely vocal and extremely loyal to Blue Belt flavors <laughs> and they will tell us that. Um, so if we were to discontinue a flavor, you know, find a new supplier because maybe they went out of business. Um, and we came back out with a product and it wasn't as good, oh, well, people would be super upset about it. And so it takes us a really long time sometimes to find suppliers that either meet that expectation or exceed it. So well, it was, y'all were making it before y'all shut the whole plant. Uh -huh. So it didn't come back when the plant opened up. Yeah, and there's some flavors that, you know, over time just go out of. No, um, it was bigger than that original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they go out of rotation to make room for new flavors because we can only make so many flavors within a year. Um, but never count it out because we still have the recipes for all the flavors. Um, and you know, sometimes equipment or even our machines might go out of date, and there's not a suitable replacement for them. Um, I know cantaloupe and cream is another one of them. 
Um, cantaloupes are not the cleanest fruit in the world. Like, you know, whenever, even you clean them at home, they're kind of hard to, to peel and to, to mess with. So that's one flavor where our current machines and our current processes, we wouldn't be able to produce a flavor like that. So, but never count them out. Who knows one day they might come back uh, if you email us enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Say that again. Dark chocolate. Dark chocolate. Yes, we do have dark chocolate in some of our products. So um, specifically, we have a lot of dark chocolate chunks. Mm -hmm. um, that is a lot of where dark chocolate comes from. We have dark chocolate swirls. Um, or what we call variegates, the swirls and the sauces mm -hmm. in our ice creams. As far as an actual dark, dark chocolate base flavor, we don't currently. It's either a Dutch milk. or a milk chocolate yeah. base. Yeah. Suggestion you yeah. <laughs> so that's a flavor suggestion right there. So we will take that back to Britain. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've noticed that some of the uh, places that uh, hand scoop bluebell. They have different flavors that I've never seen on the shelf mm -hmm. in the store. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Great question. Yeah. You want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> no, yeah. So uh, a lot of our three-gallon flavors are, or our three-gallon flavors are a little more expansive, I would say, than our typical flavors because we make about 30 to 40 flavors, like, I, like we said, in a given year. But our three gallons, we can basically make any flavor because we're servicing food accounts only with our three gallons. So a lot of flavors that end up being discontinued will sometimes still make in the three gallon variety, which is why you see like, for instance, red velvet cake is one and like cinnamon, cinnamon. Uh, there's a whole bunch. Yeah, that we, Crazy colors. exactly, Crazy yeah. Colors. Yep. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff. There's a lot more in the three gallon variety just cause it's a lot easier for us to maintain, you know, a variety in the three gallons. We don't have to mass produce it as well. Mm -hmm. So we can make it on a much smaller scale yeah. Um, and we only have one of those lines in Burnham. So rather than the 10 half gallon lines in Burnham, we just have one three gallon. Yeah. So it's very specific as far as ingredient availability and actual scheduling of it. It's a lot easier um, to make a new one every day and still make enough to supply everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. do, two more. Yep. do all of the flavors start out as vanilla or is there a step before vanilla? So it starts out as just a regular base. So there's no vanilla. Um, it starts out as what we call a supreme base. There's no vanilla, there's no flavoring to it. It's just a, just a white base. You have a white base and a chocolate base. Um, and then from there, we'll add in vanilla because some, um, not every base is vanilla. Because you might have, even though it looks like a white base, it might be a sugar uh, cookie or a cake batter uh, base. So they're all a little bit different, even natural vanilla bean is a different base. Um, and then you have your chocolate bases, um, can either be that Dutch base or the milk chocolate or the dark chocolate base mm -hmm. back there. So uh, it starts out as just those two and then once it gets to our flavoring tanks, that's whenever we'll add in that vanilla extract um, or even the vanilla bean part as mm -hmm. well. Let's do two more questions, is that fine? I mean, we've got time. We've got time to take a question. Okay, okay. okay. Well, we'll start with you. Yes, ma'am. Is the milk tested at the farm or in delivery? Um, we test our milk actually when we receive it um, for delivery. yes, ma'am, at delivery, um, and then of course we it gets pasteurized, and then we pasteurize the the mix of ice cream itself. So in a way, the milk's kind of been pasteurized twice by the time it's gone. It gets into our area where we start actually making it a flavor. So so that, that allows us to accept or reject any shipment we get in. Yeah. So if it there's a lot of different tests that they run based on the uh, nutritional content, the fat content. Um, even the taste profile of milk. Mm -hmm. Microbiology. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. So if it doesn't meet certain standards, because we source it from such a large area, it all has to taste the same. That way, if you're eating homemade vanilla from this week or last week, it tastes the same, even though it's different milk. It might have come from different dairies, um, but because it's raw, we, we kind of get it at a base level rather than accepting pasteurized or pre pasteurized milk. Um, and then from there, we pasteurize it. And then pasteurize the base. So, yep. Yeah. Actually, yep. Yeah. You're buying milk from dairies direct or from a cooperative? Uh, both. Mm -hmm. So, local dairies and dairy co ops, so the DFA, 
uh, kind of helps facilitate that as well. Um, yes, ma'am. So each different color is a separate branch, actually, that we have. So every color is a different distribution center. But then it's also color coordinated by region. So we have seven regions, and each region has a manager. And then, of course, every branch has a branch manager as well. So that's just kind of how we organize it. That way we can, you know, just keep it. So like this yellow area right here, this is what we consider our West Texas branch. So that's just their service territory for that one branch. Mm -hmm. So right here is Las Vegas, and then you've got Phoenix. We've got two Phoenix branches and a Tucson branch. So it just signifies um, how far out that service territory goes or how far that branch services. Mm -hmm. So we were just talking about that earlier. So Texas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma. Those three states eat the most ice cream, eat the most bluebell ice cream. Uh, those are what we consider our core markets. So those have the highest either uh, market share percentage, where we are in the retailers, how much people are actually buying ice cream. Um, those three states, because that is you know close to home, people know bluebell, they understand it. I'd say those three states, specifically, it's hard to tell um, which areas Houston and Dallas, the more populated areas, I mean, obviously they're gonna have a little bit more just for how many people there are. Um, but even Little Brenham, there's a lot of people that eat ice cream in Brenham. Yeah. Even though there's only 15,000 of us, we sure do eat a lot of ice cream. Yeah, I was gonna say, even even our HEB in Brenham, I don't know if any of y'all have ever been to that HEB, but there's like six freezer doors of just ice cream, just bluebell ice cream. So. You know, we always talk about how that HEB outsells a couple of our slowest markets, actually. Just that one HEB. So, yeah, a lot of ice cream moves just in our area as well. Is there a story behind the, one of my favorites, Moulin, the name and the... Yeah, so that was for the millennium, so to celebrate. So it came out in 1999 um, to celebrate the new millennium. So we called it Moulinium. Uh, because of it. It's a fantastic flavor. Chocolate, caramel, almonds, pecans, and walnuts are all in it. It's a fantastic flavor. Um, so that one came out and it sold so well. So that is a year round standard flavor. Um, and one thing about our flavors when they're new, so most recently we had Monster Cookie Dough. Um, fantastic flavor. Typically they come out for about three months. So that's what we consider a new run. So whatever can sell within those three months. Um, and then if it does really well and consumers really take to it, well then we'll come back out with it the following year. Um, and if it just continues to sell well, then it might have the potential to become what we call a standard flavor or a year round flavor. And do you have different flavors in different uh, stores? So that's one thing about our distribution. So Bluebell employees get to pick what goes in the store. So the retailers don't. So pros and cons. A pro is that our people understand what consumers like and what they don't like. So while this Walgreens might have cookie two-step, this CVS might have chocolate chip cookie dough because they prefer different ones. Um, if you have a particular store that you shop at and you don't see your favorite flavor or you don't see something there, talk to your store and ask them. Say, I want to know how to get this flavor and then they then tell our drivers what to put in the store. So our people, the ones delivering it to the stores, actually are able to control uh, what flavors go where. Yeah. And the more you ask for it, the more shelf space we get, the more flavors we can put out there, and the happier we can make you guys. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Fantastic. 
So to answer your first question, so Oklahoma and Alabama, they roughly make up about 25% of what we make every year. So they're supporting systems for Brenham. In Brenham, we primarily make most of the new flavors, three gallon flavors, and a lot of our snack items. Specifically, the only product that we don't make in Brenham are banana pops. And that is only made in Silicon Alabama. For some reason, they only have that one machine there, and that's the only plant. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating banana pops here in Texas, it was made in Alabama. Mm -hmm. Now the other plants are really supporting systems for us, so they supply a lot of our standard flavors, our year-round flavors, but a lot of our new flavors might require a certain process or a certain machine, something that we're testing out for the first time, say, um, Dr. Pepper Float. Mm -hmm. We only made that in Burnham because it's a combination of that Dr. Pepper sherbet and the actual ice cream. So because that required a certain process, we wanted to control that in Burnham to make sure it was done correctly. So we only made that. So everywhere in the region came from Burnham.